Obi-Wan Kenobi is finally here. This is my review of the first two episodes, and it's going to be a little different from my normal reviews, being at Celebration and everything. We're just swamped and don't have time to do much more other than sit and talk, but let's do this. Everything starts with heartbreak as we are forced to watch Order 66 again from the point of view of several younglings as their teacher does their best to protect them. In the present day, the Inquisitors come to Tatooine tracking a Jedi who barely escapes. This is when the Grand Inquisitor delivers his speech about the Jedi Code being an itch that Jedi can't help but do the right thing. If they see someone in need, they're going to help. A Jedi named Nari did exactly that on Tatooine, so now he's on the run. We meet the third sister, who even the other Inquisitors think of as a loose cannon. She is the one to reveal Nari, and she almost kills him, but the Grand Inquisitor stops her. Maybe for information, or maybe because he doesn't want her to overstep her station, maybe both. Either way, Nari escapes and eventually seeks out Obi-Wan Kenobi. But our hero is not acting all that heroic right now. He's working a menial job to get by, he's living in a cave, watching over Luke, having nightmares, and attempting to speak with Qui-Gon Jinn. I love that he seems to be unable to do so because he's not being very Jedi-like. When Nari does eventually catch up with him, Kenobi basically turns down the itch of the Jedi Code. He sees a man in need, someone just like him, and he refuses to help. He tells Nari to stop helping people and to bury his lightsaber in the desert, which is obviously a metaphor for Kenobi burying who he is and his past and his connection to the Force and all of his trauma deep down inside of him. It's rough seeing Obi-Wan send Inari away, but I did like that he still has a soft side. He trades parts with a Jawa named Tika in a very funny scene so he can build Luke a toy model of the T-16 Skyhopper, which is very sweet. But Owen returns it, demanding for what seems like the millionth time that Kenobi stay away from their family. Then the Inquisitors show up and Owen has a chance to sell out the former Jedi that watches all of them from afar. I really liked that scene, and I thought for sure Owen was going to accidentally say something like, if you're looking for Kenobi, he's gone, being unaware that the Inquisitors were actually searching for Nari. But he doesn't, and he holds himself together in the face of danger. The tension is cut from that scene a bit, because obviously we know Owen is fine, but I still think that it was great to see he's not willing to throw Obi-Wan under the bus. If anything, he just offered more assistance than Kenobi offered Nari. Meanwhile, across the galaxy, we travel to Alderaan, which was shocking to see. I remember there being whispers of Leia in this series, but I was still so taken aback, and getting to see Leia and Brea and Bale was fantastic. I loved seeing Leia being exactly who I would imagine her to be as a child. Vivian Lyra Blair crushed it. The scene with her shutting down her snotty cousin who said she wasn't even a real Organa was fantastic, but I loved the scene afterwards, watching her take in some wisdom from both her parents, but she still has that defiant side, and instead of apologizing to her cousin, runs off into the woods where she is kidnapped by Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Bale contacts Obi-Wan, pleading for help, and again he says no. I love that he refuses the call to adventure twice. It's interesting seeing him in basically Luke's position in A New Hope. Obi-Wan invites him to Alderaan, and he says he can't get involved, his uncle needs him, blah blah blah. Nine years before that, Kenobi had people begging him for help, and he's like, I mean, I have to watch the boy, and I gotta clean up my cave, you know, I'm very busy. It takes Bale coming to Tatooine in person to get him to go out in the desert, dig up his lightsabers, and get his butt on a ship headed for Dayu and Princess Leia. That scene was both completely on the nose and completely perfect. So in the second episode, we get off Tatooine. Obi-Wan starts searching the underworld for Leia, which takes him to Kumail Nanjiani's character, Haja. I love him. I love that we saw him in the trailer, and we were like, oh, is he a fellow Jedi in those robes? But he's just a con man. It's perfect casting. He nailed the over-the-top shtick. I feel like that would have been a difficult scene to get right, but it worked very well for me. And even though he is a con man, he is helping people. He's taking their credits on a lie, I want to make it clear that's not good, but he's helping people escape, and it sounds like he was even helping a young, force-sensitive boy. It kind of mirrors Obi-Wan and Nari in the first episode. Oh, and I forgot Obi-Wan saw that Nari didn't make it and was strung up for all the citizens to see. His inaction wasn't responsible for his death, but it's at least partially on him for doing nothing. 
Anyway, Kenobi sneaks his way through the underworld until he is briefly captured by Flea and his crew. I like that they kidnapped Leia just because they wanted Bale's daughter. They have no idea who she really is or why she's important. Nobody is getting close to the truth about Luke and Leia yet. I like it that way so far. Taking Leia was all meant to be a trap by the third sister to bring out Obi-Wan. It sounds like she wants to kill him to gain favor with Darth Vader because all the other Inquisitors look down on her. When the Grand Inquisitor shows up to Dayu, he says they took her from the gutter. They make it sound like she was a street urchin or something, but I suspect she was one of the younglings from the Order 66 scene. Anyway, Obi-Wan finds Leia and they start to make their escape, and their dynamic was wonderful. I love how Leia questions him being a real Jedi over and over again, because he's not right now. Helping Leia seems to be the first Jedi thing he's done in a while, and even then he's not using the Force and he had to be guilted into it. It starts out as a bit of a joke, but Leia starts to distrust him because she realizes he's not acting like a Jedi should. I think that's great. I always think there's a danger, especially with young characters, that they just wind up being frustrating and they won't listen, but they did a really great job at showing why she eventually runs from Obi-Wan. I fully bought it. Their run across the rooftops catches the attention of several bounty hunters who Kenobi dispatches, but Leia falls and the Jedi finally has to tap back into the Force to catch her, and it seemed like a struggle, but he does it. He is open with Leia, he shows her who he truly is, even if it is buried deep down, and she learns to trust him. And then Haja comes back to help them too. He gives them coordinates to another planet on a cargo ship that isn't guarded or locked down by the Inquisitors, and it's so great that it's all recorded on a Sabat card, because Kenobi is taking a gamble by trusting him. But he has no other choice, and Haja does prove his worth by standing in the third sister's way, pretending to be a Jedi again to buy them time. I hope we haven't seen the last of him. As they reach the cargo ship, Obi-Wan starts to tell Leia about Padme. Not overtly, but enough for the audience to appreciate how much of Leia's mother Obi-Wan sees in her. But the third sister catches up to them, and now it's his turn to maybe buy some time, which he does by just hiding and preparing. And I love that they're teasing him using his lightsaber, but not yet. I'm glad he didn't ignite it yet. I think that needs to be a big moment. While he hides, Reva mentions that Lord Vader will be pleased with his capture, and Obi-Wan learns for the first time in ten years that Anakin survived. I am so glad we're getting to see this unfold. It'll probably be the big thing he grapples with next week, because as he escapes, we cut to Vader in his back-to-tank, hooked up to machinery, which is just a great way to end the episode. But I do need to jump back to Reva attacking the Grand Inquisitor, and maybe killing him? What's going on there? Because that character is definitely alive in Star Wars Rebels, which takes place later in the timeline. I immediately had people asking me about this, and I think the easy answer is that he's just not dead. Let's watch the next four episodes and see what happens. For now, I'm under the assumption that he survived the stabbing, even if it happens off-screen and the character doesn't appear in the show again. But let's just wait a few more weeks, and then we can address it more fully. I think that's all I have to say for now. Like I said, kind of a weird review for me. I only had the chance to watch both episodes once last night, and it was so late, and I was so tired, and I woke up to knock this out before heading back into celebration. I probably forgot a lot of stuff, but my general impression is an emphatic hell yes. I love how much they're treating this like a movie, including the long time ago at the start, the credits being over a starfield at the end, of course John Williams writing a theme. I love the pacing so far, where we might be hitting one new planet every week. I kinda thought we'd be on Dayu for a while. It's looking really great, I forgot most of this show was shot on the volume. So far, it's living up to the hype, although I look forward to revisiting these episodes and watching them next week under less stress. But what did you think of the first two episodes? Let me know in the comments. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel to keep up with all our Kenobi and Celebration coverage, follow us on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and consider checking out our Patreon page. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.